everyone, I'm Elizabeth Hines and welcome to a whole new decade of Coast Connections. It's January and we're being walloped by winter storms. We have BC Hydro with us tonight to talk about um, not only how they generate the power around the province, but some of the most memorable power outages that they had last year. And I know we experienced a lot of that ourselves and uh, I hear tell that there's another storm on the way too. So um, to help us get more prepared, we have Carla Lowers from BC Hydro. Welcome, Carla. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. You've been there for 17 years or so with BC Hydro? That's right, a couple of different hats, but there the whole time. <laughs> You've seen a lot of uh, power outages and uh, um, experiences there at Hydro that uh, we're going to learn about uh, tonight. Um, Carla, when I was doing my research, I was really surprised to learn that there's 82 dams in the province. Like Hydro, BC Hydro generates a lot of hydroelectricity for this province as well as delivering it and selling it to us. So have you been to any of the dams? I have. I visited a couple on the island. Uh, and I think it's a really valuable experience for British Columbians especially to get out and see how we make power. Mm -hmm. The one up at Campbell River, I think, is the one that you went to. The, the Yes, the John Hart uh, Dam is a, a, a great place that you can visit and see the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a suspension bridge within the Elk Falls uh, Park that is a great vantage point. And that's all open to the public. That's right. Yeah, Nice, yeah. Um, at 40 different sites around the province, and also I, uh, when I was doing my research, 18,000 kilometers of transmission lines. Um, that's like three return trips to Halifax from Victoria. From Victoria to Halifax is about 6,000 kilometers. And you guys have 18,000 kilometers of transmission lines? And that's just transmission lines. If you count the distribution lines in there as well, the lower voltage lines, we actually have 79,000 kilometers of, of distribution and tra transmission wow. lines. That's a lot that's of lines. That's right, yes. And of course, we live in one of the most treed areas on the planet. So power lines and trees, <laughs> sometimes not the best of friends. <laughs> Absolutely, I think we have to get used to that power outages are inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, BC has the highest tree count uh, per kilometer of utility line anywhere in North America. Wow. And Vancouver Island has three times more three times more trees than the rest of the province. So the challenges specifically here for hydro are very, very high. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We've got some photos from some storms. I think some of these were from last year, but it just so shows the destruction in general mm -hmm. that we're going to run through. Um, and just the massive uh, destruction that happens. Here's a transmission down. So you can barely see the road and there is a road underneath all those trees and poles. That was in the 2018 windstorm in December. Again, very similar. Uh, trees taking down our power lines. And that's an aerial view of that one with all the windswept uh, trees down from above. And a huge cedar root ball there. Um, and that's a tree taken down from a beaver. <laughs> And another huge tree down. These are massive trees, um, especially here on the island that come down. And of course, your marvelous crews responding to this. Yeah, yeah. that photo it was taken last year, also in the December 2018 windstorm. And you can get an idea in regards to the amount of work it takes to restore power. When you see that kind of damage, it wasn't just branches on lines. It was trees or multiple trees down, taking down spans and spans of wire. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to work with uh, vegetation crews, our power line technicians, flaggers, uh, dispatchers. We also have a social media team making sure that the message is getting out to customers so they can prepare for the duration of outages. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of work. A lot of work and a lot of teamwork. Yes. Um, and I think there's 700 uh, crew that you have available, but also in communities around the province, 70 communities, you also have contractors that you um, rely on as well. Yeah, we have um, well-developed restoration plans mm -hmm. that we can easily ramp up when we know that a storm is coming. Uh, and so we can move those resources around as needed. Mm -hmm. And you also have in-house meteorologists who can predict when some of these uh, storms are going to be coming our way. Yeah, that's a really important factor in regards to knowing what's coming our way mm -hmm. and how we can respond mm -hmm. appropriately. Yeah, and you can be better prepared and help us um, as customers be better prepared as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, 1866, is it? 
1-800-BC-HYDRO mm -hmm. is the number to call to report outages. In fact, it's the number to call to get all your hydro questions answered. If you've got a, a question in regards to your service, that's the number to call. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is if there's a down power line, we are encouraging customers to phone 911. Right. Yeah, very important. And Carla, just a good reminder, if there is a down power line, how far are we supposed to stay away? 10 meters, that's about the length of a, a school bus. Mm -hmm. Like don't go anywhere near that. That's right, yeah. you wanna keep that distance to yeah. keep yourself safe and also keep others from getting within that uh, distance as well. Mm -hmm. And if I'm operating a power tool around uh, any um, you know, power line, transmission lines, how far away should me and my tool be? Uh, so about the length of a four door car is the safe distance to be. Um, I encourage people if they are working around power lines to visit our website to make sure that they're um, aware of the hazards. Power mm -hmm. lines are a hazard. Um, we also have underground infrastructure as well. So the um, making sure that you're phoning dialing before you dig yeah. to make sure that you're minimizing any uh, risk that you might be putting yourself mm -hmm. in. Very good. Let's get right into some of these memorable uh, outages from last year, Carla. There's some really good examples. Um, we're going to start off with the animal encounters about the, the itchy bear in uh, Williams Lake. <laughs> the bear using our pole as a scratch exactly. post and, uh, yeah. and taking out power. So in, in fact, there was two instances in the last year where that that created a power outage, a bear using poles as scratching posts. So uh, memorable and and happening more than once. So do they actually knock the pole out from the force of the, ru the rubbing? No, what they're doing is they're um, knocking the equipment off. When you look oh. up at a power line, you'll you'll see the lines are resting on insulators. Yes. And so, so they're can reconfiguring the system in a way that it shouldn't be. So we have protective pieces of equipment that will detect the fault and knock out the power to keep people safe. How frequent does that happen with the bears? Uh, well, animals and birds yeah. account for about 10% of power outages. Wow, and um, don't imagine they survive all of those. We'll talk about that in a little <laughs> more. But in terms of bears, um, again, here on Vancouver Island, we have the highest black bear population in North America. There's about 70,000 black bears here. and it's a opposed to 120,000 in the whole province. So a lot of bears, a lot of power poles, a lot of potential power outages, but not as many as you would think. Given as you think, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, I remember a story from a few years ago when our power line crews were called out where a bear had actually climbed a pole and they were tasked with getting the pole, the bear down safely from the pole they were able to disconnect power to keep the bear safe. Aww. So it wasn't injured. It did come down the pole, but it sure made for an exciting day work for our crews up in the North Islands. No kidding. What did they do? Put a big honey pot at the bottom of the <laughs> <laughs> pole and lure him down? I think they might have poked the bear, which is not what you're supposed no. to do. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, the bald eagle and the goose. I think this was up near uh, Clinton. Yes, yeah. this is really uh, quite interesting. Uh, so one of the memorable outages was a bald eagle that dropped its dinner on the power lines. Its dinner being a Canadian goose, of course. Um, so certainly an interesting uh, restoration. And it just caused the line to short circus because it the goose became the conductor? Well, so they're quite large birds. <laughs> yeah. uh, so when they come in contact with more than one phase of the line, it does, it does result in an outage. Mm, one very cooked goose. <laughs> cooked goose. Yeah. And busy beavers. We saw the picture of, uh, that you just showed of the, the, the beaver that took down the, um, the pole, but, uh, or the tree that hit the pole. That's but, right. Yeah. So that was in Hazelton and Dawson Creek. Um, yeah, there's... And beavers certainly can cause a little bit of havoc on the system. And we've had that happen in, on Vancouver Island as well. Uh, in previous years, it didn't make the most memorable outage list for <laughs> 2019, but um, maybe that's a good thing yeah. <laughs> for Vancouver Island residents. <laughs> well, it is Canada after all, and you know, the beaver is our national symbol. So <laughs> the two shall collide. Now, how about the I spy security camera? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so we had somebody attach a security camera to our pole and um, we did remove the camera safely. We didn't look at any of the footage. <laughs> um, we, we don't know who, who did it, but we 
don't recommend affixing anything to the poles. In fact, it's a WorkSafe BC violation, mm -hmm. uh, creates hazard for our crews, and and also uh, something that your neighbors probably aren't too happy to yeah. find out about either. No kidding. Now, when you say attaching anything to the pole, do you mean even like signs that say, you know, uh, rock concert coming in next weekend or missing cat? Yeah, a lot of times when people are attaching things to the pole, they're using metal nails and equipment and not always so great at taking them down either. And they are a hazard for our crews. Our crews do still climb poles and, um, and those objects on poles or the remnants that they leave behind do create a safety risk for our workers. Good to know. Yeah, good to know. Um, the drone groan. <laughs> a lot more drones around. <laughs> yes, That's wreaking absolutely. havoc with your infrastructure. <laughs> uh, another that was uh, in the lower mainland. Um, somebody's drone came in contact with the power lines and uh, hence it made the most memorable outage list. Mm. Did the drone get cooked? Like was that? Uh... I, I don't think the drone did get damaged. I'm oh. not sure. It was obviously still on site when our crews arrived to be able to note it, or we heard the story. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. That's wild. Now, of course, the weather um, is, and Mother Nature's fury is one of the probably biggest reasons for some of these outages. But um, the wind woes were over 20,000 co uh, customers in North Van and West Van lost power in November after a what you call a bomb cyclone. Yes, just wreaked havoc on a portion of our system on the lower mainland so quite an isolated event mm -hmm. but uh, certainly memorable especially for those impacted no kidding <laughs> and a bomb cyclone is basically like a winter hurricane is it not sort of generally speaking yes yes we're a really um, sharp drop in pressure in a very short period of time creates this um, little Cyclone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what ripped through uh, Stanley Car Park about 10 years ago, too, causing all that damage. It, with the 2006 outages? Yes. Is that what yeah. you're referring to? Yes. That was another bomb, cyclone bomb. Um, okay. This I didn't know. Balloon blunders. Yes. Who knew? First, let's talk about the hot air balloon, for goodness sake. Ooh. What a scary ride. <laughs> yes. Whoa. And that was up in Vernon, I think? Uh, we're a hot air balloon with passengers just made contact with the line and luckily it broke free and nobody was was impacted but certainly um, these memorable outages are a good reminder to play safe around electricity yes. um, know your hazards and and avoid them yes wow that would be one scary ride somebody's birthday party like <laughs> yeah and then speaking of parties party balloons yes so uh, last year we had 52 Call outs as a res 52 outages as a result of balloons coming really? in contact with the lines. That's one a week. Uh, so, so balloons do certainly impact our system. They also present a safety hazard. Um, often, retail outlets will use large balloons to advertise sales or specials. Oh, sure. And sometimes they break free, and, and sometimes they're large enough that the balloon is in contact with our power lines. And then the remainder of the balloon is hanging so low that it presents a hazard to people that might be below it. In a normally safe situation, it's now created a hazard for... You could also, you could get electrocuted then if you were to touch the end of that balloon. Yes, absolutely. Wow, I did not know that. That's yes. Awesome. Yeah, and I didn't think about that, the big, huge, uh, some car dealerships use those. But yeah, if they get free, uh, where yeah. are they going to land? So we, yeah. I think really the message there is look up, see what's around you. Perhaps that's not the best place to, yeah. to use those. Uh, and if you are going to use them, make sure that they're very secure. Exactly. And same with flying kites, of course. Yes, same I think thing. that's a message that so many of us are used to and have heard for years and years. Um, but balloons hasn't, haven't been a message that you, you think about that often, yeah. but certainly a hazard as well. As kids growing up, you always heard about the kites and the power lines, right? But That's you didn't right. consider balloons. Yeah. And uh, has any kite surfer ever been uh, near power lines? Well, not that I recall, but yeah. that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So not kite surfing on any of the, the lakes of the dams or anything? <laughs> <laughs> let's I hope not. Yes, let's hope not. <laughs> that would be a little too memorable. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, and this is really pathetic, but the not so sharp shooter. I mean, seriously, people. Yes. So it, it, when you look at our infrastructure, you, you do see um, this is referring to the transmission lines when we say hunters, but perhaps they were just uh, 
people being foolish yeah. out in the woods and they actually were shooting out our insulators. It also creates a hazard for, for the public, for our workers, and a, and a, a really senseless uh, vandalism, vandalism yeah. of public equipment. And you can be charged with vandalism if, if you're caught doing yes, that, Yes, that's right. right. We, are, yeah. we also involve the RCMP in these incidents as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And how prevalent is that, that your, the infrastructure is getting shot up like that? That's, you know, yeah. kind of wild west. Um, so our transmission lines are often in rural areas, mm -hmm. um, kind of off the beaten path slightly. Uh, so unfortunately, it happens more than I'd, than I'd like to say. Yeah. Um, there was an incident uh, probably about 10 years ago where the whole North Island was impacted with a power outage as a result of somebody shooting out the insulators on that transmission line. Wow. Really big impact for a really senseless event. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, four steps to restoring power. Uh, you've got a really good graphic on your website and if viewers want to go to hydro.com, they can see it for themselves. But the first step when the power goes out um, in your house is Look outside to make sure it's just not your own house. <laughs> that's right. And when you phone 1-800-BC-HYDRO, that's one of the things that they'll ask you. Are your neighbors also out? Mm -hmm. What if you have no neighbors? You're out in the boonies. <laughs> yeah. Any dead gooses, geese in your yard? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, notify them. So they, um... well, now will your meter actually notify as well? Yes. The new meters? Yes. So smart meters do, it's a really great resource actually when outages occur, particularly in those big storm events, they do notify us of outages and mm -hmm. the customers that are impacted as a result of the outage. Mm -hmm. What smart meters don't tell us is what's caused that outage. So uh -huh. we still rely on customers phoning in to, to let us know if they've heard something, if they saw something, mm -hmm. um, to help us uh, respond more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And when Hydro is responding efficiently, they obviously the call comes in. There's a plan developed um, to you know address the threats to public safety first and foremost. That's right. That's always our first priority is mm -hmm. public safety. So um, in events where we've got more than one outage, those that do have a downline or emergency services on site, a fire, those will be our first priority. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you obviously restore, restore power to the highest density areas first. Yes, it yeah. makes sense. So, you know, if we're working in a small neighborhood um, and there's 3,000 customers out, it really makes sense for us to focus on that larger mm -hmm. group of customers mm -hmm. first. And your response times are pretty impressive. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. So um, about 95% about of the time, customers are restored within 24 hours of an outage happening in these st storm events. Mm -hmm. um, so we prepare all year long for outages. We have efficient response plans. And in relation to storms, we do have an idea when they're coming and what their impact yeah. might look like. So we can prepare to get those response times down. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the small fixes in individual homes obviously are the last um, to come back online. That's right. It's similar to how a municipality would clear roads in the event of a um, snowstorm. They get those really, you know, the highways and those main roads first, and it's, you know, the cul-de-sacs and those small off the beaten path kind of roads last. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting in our home, the power is out, Carla, and we're thinking, I shoulda, woulda, coulda. <laughs> how should we best prepare for a power outage? What are some of the three top three tips that you have for our viewers? Yeah, it, just to go back to the I shoulda, I woulda, I coulda, um, about 50% of British Columbians have an emergency kit. And only 50%? Only 50%, and of the 50% that don't have one, only about 12% of them are planning on purchasing one in the next year. So I think there might be a lot of I would have, I should have, I could have. Um, mm. But uh, I, so having an emergency kit is, is a really great start to be prepared mm -hmm. uh, in relation to storm preparedness, um, making sure that you have a flashlight with working batteries, extra batteries, a first aid kit, some water and some ready to eat food. And cash is also really important as well. Mm, very good point because if the power is out, the ATM is going to be out as well. Yeah. Or the ATM being MOM. Um, <laughs> also may not have cash. Yeah. Um, now, if we're using a propane stove or something, if our power is out, what yeah. are some of the do's and don'ts there? Yeah, so you don't want to use a propane stove or a gas generator inside of your house. You want to make sure that you're using those safely um, with lots of 
fresh air. So outside is outside. the best place to do that. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a very, very clear danger if you're using those uh, inside the home. And I would even yeah. recommend, uh, you know, candles have been used for years and years, but I think there's LED lanterns are a much safer alternative mm -hmm. as well. So making sure that you've got um, something like that with extra batteries to last you the duration of a power outage. Mm -hmm. And really you should be prepared for about 72 hours without power at a minimum. Wow. That's a long time when the lights are out. Yes, yes. Seven minutes is a long time. Yeah, yeah. And Who are these people that I live with? <laughs> exactly, yeah. You're all forced together. And, uh, you know, your cell phones and computers and that have backup chargers for those, so you can contact Hydro. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. And we have a really great website, and we've made some improvements very recently um, following the 2018 storm, and then also um, within the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. So you can visit bchydro.com on your mobile device to get updates in regards to the outage. Very good. Now, Carla, we've just come off one of the warmest decades in history. We all know about um, climate change. And um, what is hydro doing to sort of prepare for the short and long term for these very different weather patterns that we're seeing here uh, very close to home? Yeah, so we've been involved with uh, climate change research since the early 1990s. So our our concern, our focus, is really about maintaining the reliability of the power system. Mm -hmm. And we're integrating climate change into our planning, our design, and our operating mm -hmm. um, systems. And one of the big focuses is the increasing amount of weather, um, whether it be the impacts of uh, forest fires, wildfires, yes. um, floods or even increased storms so it's yeah. preparing our system for that earthquakes as well we live on you know, we live in a seismically active area yes much, so. mm -hmm. absolutely uh, so it's preparing for that so some of its automation we talked about smart meters mm -hmm. um, in regards to outage detection to allow us to respond to those events faster um, we also we also have uh, alternate supplies that we use traditionally wood poles have been predominant in our systems right. in areas where wildfires um, are becoming mm -hmm. more common. Uh, we are looking at switching to alternate uh, structures, steel, fiberglass that can withstand uh, yeah. that devastation. Yeah, very good to know. And um, the infrastructure too, like, I mean, a lot of the, the dams and sites are aging. Um, you know, some of these structures were built in the 1940s, 50s, that type of thing. And with the increase in population in BC expected over the next uh, 20 years, I think we're going to grow by another 1.5 million or so here. Um, what are the plans for some of the infrastructure renewal? So we, we have a very rigorous uh, system to make sure that we're upgrading to maintain our system, to minimize outages, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we can handle the increased load. Um, some of it's, again, automation on our system so we can see when a system is getting close to being overloaded so right. we can upgrade it accordingly. Um, and we also use uh, other automation devices to help us restore power without actually having to attend site. So mm. to to, it's like a circuit breaker, I guess. It would sectionalize a portion of the line um, okay. before or after, sorry, after the trouble and be able to restore them automatically. Wow. How does that work with automation restoring lines? It's through our Fraser Valley Operations Center. Um, they're able to monitor the system and, uh, and use something that we call reclosers mm -hmm. to do just what I spoke about. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Certainly, yes, yes. Yeah. Now, um, how can we um, keep ourselves safer during storms? Like, okay, we've prepared, but also we need to stay safe while the power is out and while there is debris and things. And also, how do we help to keep your crews safer? So I think the, the most important message is that if you see a down power line, a low power line, mm -hmm. um, something that just doesn't look normal, stay back. 10 meters, uh, again, I'll say it again, just to drill it in, the length of a school bus. That's a very important message for people. You, power lines, when they're down, they're not necessarily whipping or sparking or right. buzzing in any way. Um, they may look very benign. That's you know, right. So you'll have on. to assume that they're energized and yeah. keep your distance. Mm -hmm. um, so phoning 911 so those first responders can get out there and secure the scene mm -hmm. before hydro arrives. That'll be our first priority to get to sites like that so we can make the repairs 
and um, return the system to normal. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you mentioned in the, was it the 2018 power outage? Uh, you live very close to a substation. I don't know if that was really good planning or <laughs> <laughs> being a hydro employee, that's very smart. Things to know. <laughs> <laughs> but with the crews that were descending here on the island, your home actually became sort of the, uh, the meeting place. Tell us about that. That's right. So actually, not for crews, but for many of my oh. neighbors and friends um, that didn't have power, uh, they were able to come to my house and maybe catch up on a television show, take a warm shower and, and make a meal. So I, of course, was at the office um, <laughs> throughout the power outage, but it was a, a neat little story of coming together. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the nice things about if there's a positive side to a power outage is, it's ironic, but because we're disconnected from power, we tend to be connected more as human beings. Absolutely. So it's sort of mother's nature's way of getting us to get together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, any exciting new projects up, upcoming for Hydro in the next year? We've got about a minute to wrap here. So uh, we replace about 10,000 poles a year. So wow. that's something that always, throughout the province, so that's something that I think everybody will be able to see and experience. And sometimes it means that you might have a planned power outage as a result of it. Mm -hmm. um, but that small inconvenience is one of the ways that we keep our system reli reliable and safe. So, so that's one of the uh, interesting things that we do. Uh, for Vancouver Island, there's lots of stuff happening. Uh, we'll be replacing the underground submarine cables that serve Protection Island uh, mm. this year. Um, that's a massive job. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So, and a really interesting job as well that uh, people in Nanaimo will be able to see from the Mafeo Sutton Park. How long will that project take? And well, we have to work within the, the tides, the low tides for mm -hmm. some of the work. So we'll begin work this spring and expect to have it in service in fall. There's several components to the work and, mm -hmm. and several different areas where we'll be working. Wonderful. Carla, you're uh, just a font of information. Thank you so much for sharing um, your tips and insights and most memorable power outages from last year. We wish you, uh, you know, full power going ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to having you back next year to talk about uh, some of the other memor memorable storms that we've had. Thank you thank for Thank you so much, me. Carla. And thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Coast Connections. Stay connected. Thank you.